Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, go boom. Double feature, double. That's good. I like that. Yeah, thanks. It's a fresh tune. My name is Eric, and I'm here with uh, Michael singing some songs yeah. on uh, this episode of Double Feature. We got a couple movies today, right? We do. We're doing a pair of films today. We're doing some, uh, what are we, giant friend films? Yeah. So this is, uh, this is great, because these movies are similar on the surface. They're very similar. Almost to the point we try and avoid. Yep. Right? Giant friends, double feature, terrible idea. Mm-hmm. Terrible idea. But they're so fucking different under the surface. We are not talking about nearly any of the same themes. We don't see the same characters between them. It's just animated films that do really interesting things. But they do also have a giant friend in them. Yeah. Weird. Fucking weird. We're doing The Iron Giant followed by Miyazaki's My Neighbor Totoro. And we're going to fucking pronounce it that way too. So be ready. Totoro, like the English dub, motherfuckers. (laughs) Don't even send me that goddamn email. You can shove it. Anyways, we're going to spoil these films Uh and uh, you can use chapters to skip over the uh, spoilers. The Iron Giant is, uh, man, I'm fucking pumped already. This is a 1957 Cold War movie. Right. Made uh, in 1999. Right. Directed by... uh... Directed by Brad Bird. Yeah. So <laughs> just animated and sci-fi and fifties and it's awesome. All sorts of yeah. I mean, I love Cold War sci-fi. That yeah, is my fucking yeah. jam. Did you ever play Destroy All Humans? Oh, video game reference. Uh wah, wah. so Brad Bird directed Iron Giant. Brad Bird also directed Ratatouille, the Pixar movie about cooking mice. Yeah. Not cooking mice, but mice who cook. Moving on. But he also directed Ghost Protocol. Wow. Mission Impossible 4. That's his first live action film. Wow. So the thing that I love about Brad Bird being attached to a 50s Cold War sci-fi movie sure. is that he can do action. Yeah. I mean, he can do the fuck out of action. Sure. But he can also, having done Pixar, I mean, this is before both of them, but it's just exemplary. Sure. Having done Pixar, he can do children's films. Sure. So here we get this wonderful melting together of intense animated action. Sure. And, you know, heartwarming. Yeah. You could, you could write it off, okay? Let's say write it off as a kid's film. Yeah. And you also, apparently, in this film, meld together 2D and 3D animation. Sure. Um, Well, and you're right. This is, uh, I mean, if this were Pixar, this would be Pixar at some of its finest moments. Sure. I mean, all the the things they hit on in this story. But yeah, we'll get to that. Let's talk about the animation. Yeah. The animation to me, it's, there's this thing with animation Mm -hmm. in, in visual media. Sure. Where there's always the standard and the standard will evolve. So look at, um, really good example. Look at, um, eighties classic cartoons, He-Man, Scooby-Doo, you know, Hanna-Barbera, and then you have He-Man and She-Ra and all those kind of really, they all look the fucking same. Thundercats. Yeah, sure. Another sure. perfect example. Yeah. Meanwhile, during that time, you have something like Heavy Metal coming out. Sure. Where the animation is so vastly different. This is the late 90s. So all the animation here is when they're really embarking on the impressions that 3d make sure. um reboot yeah is coming out beast wars pixar is finally coming out with you know toy story sure and this film goes a very innovative route and picks certain things to be 3d right the giants 3d the satellite in the beginning is 3d sure the rest of the world is 2d and it's just kind of this i mean you could argue why it's this way you know the giants from another planet and his planet has an extra dimension <laughs> um right. right or what the fuck ever But the point I'm really trying to make is when an innovative film, a film that looks as fucking good as Iron Giant comes out. Yeah. How come the next film that comes out is still We're Back? Sure. Like, why (laughs) isn't it? It's weird, isn't it? Half 3D. Like, it's it's amazing because the standard is always so much more boring than what people could be doing. Yeah, it's why we don't cover more animation, I think. Yeah, I think so, too. Because I never go to bat for it because I'm a very visual guy. And animation, there's only five animated films to me because there's only five eras of animated films right you know and I with mean? a visual aesthetic that lets you literally do anything 
Uh, mm-hmm. We talked about it when we did Scanner Darkly. We were yeah. talking about rotoscope and how the reason to do rotoscope is because when everything's animated, you can do anything. You with just it. have a scan suit at some point. Right. It doesn't even matter. Exactly. Yeah. You can't. It's so much harder to do that with practical physical yeah, effects. Absolutely. But instead, they just take the standard safe route with animation. Sure. They're boring. What yeah. the hell? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's minutia in that, too. Sure. Uh, when you look at something like we'll be talking about Totoro today, probably not a lot of the animation because right. I don't know a lot about it. But there's a, there's a level of detail to uh, a lot of anime in general. Maybe not so much the pop stuff, but uh, you know, you think about the different waves and trends in animation and how animation has to usually sell to a pretty broad audience. Right. Something like heavy metal does not have to sell that's to true. a broad audience, and maybe that's why it's different. But you, uh, you, know, you turn on Cartoon Network now, and if it, I'm, I'm really talking out of my field here, but... Sure. Uh, it kind of all strikes me as that irreverent humor, kind of, uh, yeah. the way that stuff looks. The Aqua Teen? Yeah, that, exactly. Yep. Yeah, that kind Absolutely. of look to it. And whereas, whereas, um, Nickelodeon, everything looks like Avatar Last Airbender and sure. the new Thundercats. Well, it's the reaction to, uh, anime being right. so big in the last right. 15 years, you know, to that coming over to the United States and that post pokemon kind right. of uh place and i'm not knocking any of these things sure you know i think they all stand up on their own merit despite the animation or don't but my point being is be fucking ballsier when you're animating a movie and sure. put a giant robot be in the it. iron giant yeah Can we talk about i know this is a stupid thing this movie's in two three five to one <laughs> find me another fucking animated yeah. film that uses the, sure. the fucking David Fincher aspect ratio. That's insane. Iron Giant is so cinematic. I, I just mean, attributed David Fincher to 235 to 1. Yeah. People are typing away emails. All right. You know what I mean, though, right? Yeah. No, it's I do. Cinematic. It's cinematic. Yeah, it's huge. The film, yeah, it's such a cinematic film. And there's, I mean, the statement is bold. It's, mm-hmm. it's not too buried. It's very clear what the film is doing. But it still takes a lot of balls to make your film this cinematic when it it's does. an animated film it does yeah yeah often we want to tell an epic tale but we're not prepared to basically 16 by 9 is more digestible for a common audience than sure. 235 to 1 it's a weird thing to pick on but i think that uh you know in its own way it says a lot about what this movie's going i mean it's for. a dramatic aesthetic right off the bat sure i want to talk about the characters that are in this too Hogarth is the name of the kid we're following, the sure. main protagonist. Hog hug? Yeah. He's, uh, I love that scene, too, if you want to talk about the 50s thing, to go back to that. Um, the living brain, kind of black yeah. and white. I love you know, that. Oh, my God. It's so funny. It's as if to say, we realized there was this other thing going on in the 50s, and we're not really going to be able to exploit that art form, but let's just sneak it in here so everybody knows that we love that, right. too. And it uses a lot of ideas from that sure. while not using the, the visual uh, part of that medium. But, you know, he's watching that thing while his mom's working late. He's injecting whipped cream into a Twinkie, yeah. which, I mean, that's really all you need to say about this character right there. He injects whipped cream he's into a, a Twinkie. He's a genius. Yeah. What that means. <laughs> he's a genius. He's all about the adventure. Right. Well, and that's another thing about a lot of films like this is you get Hogarth Hughes, who is your stereotypical nerdy, you know, sci-fi kid, reads comics, loves robots. He's the perfect fit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He absolutely <laughs> believes aliens are on their way. Good thing he found the robot. Right? What the fuck is that about? <laughs> now, don't yeah. get me wrong. I, sure. I absolutely understand why as a film mechanic it makes sense. Sure. But let's be honest here. How much funnier would a film where some jock kid who didn't understand robots right, at all right. followed a football into the forest, yeah. came upon an iron giant, and just did all the wrong things? You remember we were talking about Sunshine a few weeks back, and you were saying, well, this is why we're following this crew. They're doing the most important thing in yeah. the universe. Of course, they get the movie. So there could be iron giants all over the world. That's true. And it's just boring people going, oh, I got stuff to, I got to go to soccer practice. I don't have time for this. That's, yeah. That's, and Hogarth just has wow, the best one. That's very true. Okay. I curtsy to you. In a way, I guess it's kind of a buddy film, right? You have, a little bit. Uh, it's it a reminds buddy me of some of the Terminator 2 stuff. Yes. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But you're still, you're teaching lessons. Sure. You know, there's the stuff about Superman bringing in that, uh, more of that 50s yeah. um, style and sense to that, more of what was going on in the 50s. It's uh, interesting to see a movie. I mean, that's another ballsy artistic choice, too, is to blatantly point towards another piece of art and make it a thing in your film. Make mm-hmm. that really the crux of a lot of what happens, of their dynamic together, them understanding each other. They understand each other through Superman, someone else's work of right. art. I think the things that remind me about Terminator 2 is the kind of lessons about death. 
and the uh, teaching the machine. You know, in both cases, the lessons about death are coming from a child. It's something you see a lot is children teaching about death Mm -hmm. as if it's maybe a little easier to hear from them. Right. I'm not sure exactly yet why that happens. I don't think I've seen it enough or really thought about it. But it's something I wanted to point out so people could sort of look for if they haven't already sure. formulated a, a good idea on that. Well, I think in this film, what it really goes to show is that between these two characters, this giant robot and Hogarth, mm-hmm. Hogarth is more mature. He is, yeah. I mean, he's come to terms with the reality of life and death. I think it shows that he is adult enough to understand the consequences of what he's doing. Sure. If the audience wasn't made aware that he was already completely able to handle death, sure. They might start to speculate that he wasn't he wasn't sure he he didn't realize he was playing with the dynamite here. Sure. They would, you know, kind of write it off as, "Oh, he's a kid. He doesn't realize that he's got a loaded gun pointed sure. at his town." Makes the story more plausible. Sure, but he absolutely understands the gravity of life and death. And that is why he's making these decisions. And they're all, you know, they're based on maintaining life for everybody. Sure. I think it's possible that theme comes up the way it does in a lot of movies, because it's also easier to teach kind of a children's tale from their own peers. Sure. You know, you have kids coming to see this movie, maybe one, one moralistic lesson that you want them to learn is about life and death or guns. (laughs) Yeah. Or guns. It's something interesting about the childhood lessons on subjects where maybe adults are jaded too. Yeah. I think an adult comes to this movie and maybe they're more jaded because they've heard stories about life and death. They've experienced it themselves. But then seeing it come from a child, it's more eye opening. Sure. It's, oh, this was the first time you had a brush. Sure. Life. It's the, the thing in Kill Bill. Sure. It's like interrupted innocence. Yeah, that's exactly it. You know, the goldfish in Kill Bill is that interrupted innocence thing had no knowledge of this great heavy thing that now you've just taken for granted and probably tried not to think about most of your adult life. Mm -hmm. He's just one of uh, maybe four central characters to this. Aside from the giant himself, there's his mother, Annie, who's a single mom and uh, automatically just gets points for me on the show, obviously. Um, Seeing that the movie doesn't cover where his dad went Mm -hmm. doesn't really say much about his dad in the same way it doesn't say much about where the giant came from or what that's about not the story they're telling but uh instead they spend the time really bonding him and his mom you know they have the most memorable scenes are you know weird bonding moments or that tell you something about he and his mom not wasting any time on what was your upbringing like how did you not have a dad right dad's not in this that's not what this is about so you have the the scene in the diner in the beginning, you know, where you're meeting the uh, the other character, you're meeting Dean, but with the chipmunk or the rat or rodent, yeah. whatever the fuck that thing is. But the dinner scene, right? The fucking also has to invoke religion because really all this movie cares about is finding its way into double feature, sure. apparently. The uh, stop the devil from doing bad things. Yeah, that's so funny. Get out of here. Oh, Satan. my God. It's, uh, religion is so fucking silly when you talk about the devil like he's a real creature. Sure. You always talk. When you talk about the devil like he's a big robot hand in your living room. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, God is a thing that God's your personal friend and he sits there on your couch with you and t- he's the other fucking set of stupid footprints in the sand. Yeah. Fuck that. But the devil is a mysterious force that makes you eat an apple and he's just the he's really the evil within all. Ma- he's not. The fucking pitchfork uh-huh. asshole. You know, when he's just a he's guy. He's not the robot devil from Futurama. You see Hogarth talking uh, during the, what's the thing when you waste time when you could be eating? Grace. You're with your friends and you could be sharing Great. stories and laughing. Yeah, Grace. It's, no, you were right. It, it's Grace. Just shouting about, yeah, stop the devil. Get behind me, Satan. That's something else. It's a White Stripes uh, record. Whatever. You get what I'm saying. But yeah, there's Dean too. So Dean is, uh, you know, the beatnik-esque character when we wanted that from A Bucket of Blood to mm-hmm. show up in more movies. We're getting it. Hogarth goes over there and I love the coffee scene. Oh, I drink it. I'm yeah. hip to that. And he says, what does he say? This is espresso. This is like... Coffeezilla. Coffeezilla. Yeah, That's what fucking Coffeezilla. Yeah. I'm going to make some kind of drink uh, and call it Coffeezilla. We'll have to, we'll work on that. But I love just seeing him wired. Yeah. And then talking to Dean, and Dean is this great character. He works in the scrapyard, but he's an artist, too. Mm -hmm. And one is clearly has more of an impact in this town than the other. 
he points out that his scrap art is actually worth more as scrap than as art. Right. And that tells you a lot about the context of where they are, but also who he is, uh, what a lot of things mean to him. He's not in a scrapyard just because that's the position he finds. This isn't dead end road racers, whatever. Right. This is, oh, he has a connection to this through his art. Sure. Through Dean and through uh, Annie, uh, his mom, it's it's the way that the movie kind of subverts the family unit, especially in an animated film. Um, that's happened a lot more, uh, you know, in, in recent movies. But, man, over the last 10 years, I guess we've made a, a lot of progress there. The family unit in a film, especially an animated film, used to be what you think of when I say the family unit. Sure. I don't need to explain that. Everybody knows yep. what the stereotypical family looks like. But now we have Dean coming in, and he's not even playing the father role. He's playing as much the older brother as the father. Yeah. This isn't just our kid didn't have his father. Look how progressive. Okay, but his father's really just this guy in a scrapyard uh-huh. who doesn't know his mother. We're not just replacing that. We're giving you somebody who's kind of a bit of a role model, but also sort of a bad influence. Right. Giving him the espresso. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it's not even so much of a bad influence. It's that he he's irresponsible. He's, he's the punk no, influence. I should, I don't even he's want to the say, art influence. I don't even want to say irresponsible. I want to say he's not responsible. Yeah, right. He's That's not it. responsible for Hogarth. Sure. Hogarth comes over. It's not and, his problem. Yeah. Well, he doesn't have to be his father. He yeah. doesn't have to be his older brother. He, he helps him out when he can. Well, they're friends, right? Yeah. And it, they're not great friends. They're new friends. And if your friend comes over and really needs something and you don't really like them, you're not responsible to yeah, help right, them. Right. Kent would really like to think he's Hogarth's you mean friend. the guy who works for the government? Yeah, the agent of Fringe Division, uh-huh. uh, essentially. Kent's played by Christopher McDonald, who was in Requiem for a Dream. And uh, Flubber. We did that on the show. <laughs> he was in Flubber. He's in Spy Kids 2. He's, yeah. he's done uh, fucking 150 You've movies or something. You've seen him. You something. don't know his name. Yeah. You've um, definitely seen him. But this actually is different than Fringe Division, and the differences are important. Usually you have your government agent is all-knowing. He's got every single fact on the matter. In this case, um, he has trouble even convincing his immediate superior that this robot thing exists. Yeah. So this isn't the government knows everything and they're coming in, men in black, shut it down. This is, um, I found a giant robot out here. What the fuck are you talking about? There's no giant robot. So he doesn't have, you know, the upper hand that a lot of that, you know, that cliche government agent might. He can't right. just call in the army because when he tries to do that, nobody believes him. So that makes him a much more appropriate opponent for this kind of small town of single working mom and kid who reads comic books. Mm-hmm. They don't have to take down the entire government for you to believe they're winning. Or maybe they will. I like that scene a lot when he's talking to his boss. When he uh, he's trying to describe the situation, it sounds so nutty. He turns over the um, the pot holder or whatever it is on the wall. Yeah, the thing it's With got the a weird face. face. It's yeah. like it's mocking him. Yeah, well, because he feels so judged at that point. Yeah, it shows you visually how absurd you know what he's saying sounds, and that he looks over and this thing's just mocking him, like he's going crazy or mm. something. But he becomes the domineering half of that father figure. Sure. If we're gonna force the idea of a father figure into this film, right? That's something that's absent in Hogarth's life. Uh-huh. It's not completely inappropriate to go. Well, where might he get the things one gets from a father? Right. If Dean's providing a lot of the nurture and friendship, and maybe introducing him to things mom isn't, then when you look back at Kent. Ken is basically just disciplinary. Mm -hmm. He is the one who tells him, you got to be in bed at this time. I'm going to watch you the entire time you sleep. He's the one who's tracking Hogarth and making him stay in. So he's the villain and also sort of that half of the father figure, if you want to kind of split that role up between these two characters. So there's one other character. Yeah, the uh, Iron Giant. Yeah, in this film. And um, there's a moment where... Hogarth is talking about comics and there's a Tomo and there's Superman. Sure. And he, uh, he says, Oh, Tomo's a villain. He's nothing like you. That's the red flag for me. Yeah. Right. I mean, I don't know right. about you. I don't know when the moment is that you realize that, wait, this giant robot is probably not here to just be friends. Sure. sure. <laughs> um, it, for a while, I just, it makes sense. Of course, the robot's a friendly robot. It's yeah. a robot. Why could it, why would it hate anything? Right. <laughs> right. Giant towering robot. Well, you ask yourself a little bit, where did it come from? Why is it here? And then they start laughing and having such a good time that you stop asking right. that question. And then Atamo's the villain. He's nothing like you. That's right. the moment where I go, oh, 
Oh. I think it's the train for me. Really? Well, so here's the thing. Another movie might have had him derail the train track, and he puts it back together in the nick of time, but he derails that fucking train, and you think it'll be fine because, hey, people are drawn, and it's not live action. And so that's what happens in one of these movies. Uh Uh-huh. And in the nick of time, he sort of puts it together, but is still laying on the track and derails the entire fucking train. And I start thinking, first of all, I start thinking, wow, this movie will just do anything. That's fine. Just Uh kill a bunch of people on a train. They're probably okay. The train just kind of got a little derailed. No big deal. But this guy, I mean, he doesn't know his own power. Right. This uh, giant fucking robot thing is going to kill everyone. That's the first moment I think about that. You know, it's a perfect example of the movie writing to the more interesting outcome. It can resolve this scene a number of ways. It chooses not to play it safe and to show consequences instead. Yeah. It could just let the scene write itself. You reconnect the track. Everybody's fine. Whew, just in the nick of time, like everybody does. Or you could go, what's the more interesting outcome here? It's a simple writing device to just stop before you finish and go, is there a more interesting way right. to end? More people need to do that. You know, the derailment doesn't have to be the end of the world. It's not that every single one of these people is brutally slaughtered and we show it in Zack Snyder's slow motion. Mm -hmm. It's just enough to complicate things. People know about the robot now. They've seen it. Uh, We're starting to learn uh, basically what we want to accomplish in that scene is, oh, this is going to be problematic. This is not going to be an easy situation. Part of why you don't suspect that, uh, at least for a bit of time too, I think, is that you're resisting this fear instilled by the cold war both fear and wonder are something that lends itself to the cold war era of Mm sci-fi when you think about the comic books with giant robots it was this sort of what technology do the soviets have what's what's the worst case scenario of what they might have maybe they have giant destructive death robots yeah and you know there was also that constant fear duck and cover the bomb kind of stuff the um the colossus the Forbin Project sure. stuff that we talked about when we did that movie on the show. But they mentioned that in the movie in the, the Cocolac scene where they're making the milkshakes or whatever. Ken is talking about the constant worry of Sputnik. You know, Sputnik comes up uh, by name a couple times. And years later, I mean, we would have a constant worry about terrorism. Yep. There's always some kind of constant worry. Yeah, there's always a huge amount of fear. Fucking climate change, whatever <laughs> it is, something is always ending the earth. Yeah, there's impending doom. There's been impending doom for the last 112 years. Sure. Not to say that these things aren't real. No, there's been impending doom for the last 112 right, years. Right. Whether we knew what it was or not. Whether it's climate change or people who actually crashed uh, planes into buildings or Russians who were actually working on some kind of weapons or a giant death ray robot that it, well, maybe not that one, but you get what I'm saying. There are things to be alarmed about, but the sense of alarmism is the fucking absurd part. Right. It's the fact that everyone is running around as if there hasn't always been impending doom. Right. There's no point in fretting about it. You recognize it's a part of life and you fucking move on. You objectively look at situations and you better them. That's how we got out of the Cold War, is after decades, it became time. We settled down a bit, we stopped duck and covering, and we said, uh, diplomatically, how do we attempt to solve this? Right. Enough time passes, and the alarmism about one thing always, you know, always disappears. There's a brief period where everything's cool, and then we switch from terrorism to climate change. That's what happens. This is great to see what this movie's talking about, because it's so between those eras. We're not in the Cold War making this film, but it's also not 9-11 yet. This is a couple years before. So it's not just that we're seeing this and going, oh, I see, you're making a comparison to how everyone's afraid about terrorism now. This was a couple years before that happened. It couldn't have predicted this, so it's not commenting on it at all. Right. It's commenting about just a a very real thing that's happened before and will repeat itself. This is uh, even in the 50s, even in 1999, the character comes out saying, you know, we're the government, we can do anything, uh, as long as it's in the interest of protecting the people. Right. That's the excuse that they use. And that says just as much about those fear tactics, about the sort of the political message of the movie, if there is one, is that this force can always come in and exploit the fears that these people have. Sure. But they are kind of justified in this one particular time of being afraid of the robot right yeah i think i'd even go as far as to say they're justified in destroying it i mean i don't know how do you feel about that should they be trying to destroy terrifying it is really scary right he's got tentacles and lasers i (laughs) mean what do you fucking do at that point it is the right thing to do to try and destroy i know it's his friend and everything but i think it's the right thing to do to try and destroy the robot now some people might argue 
It only shoots in self-defense. Isn't that what the movie's trying to say? It only yeah. shoots in self-defense? I guess, yeah. But it's clearly programmed to do some killing. All it takes is a small misunderstanding, though. Right. You know, you start playing pretend with the robot, and then it's going to fucking death beam everybody. Well, I, I've always been under the impression with Iron Giant that it hit its head and forgot that it was sent to Earth to kill everyone. Yeah, that's probably it. You're reminding it every time you point a sure. gun at it. But what sure. happens when it just remembers? Sure. I mean, it's got it's got Roboheimers right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but, right. like, once that wears off or whatever... Just by luck, they uh, they get away with not blowing it up for a while, just long enough to figure out that it can learn. I mean, I think they're valid in trying to destroy it up to that point. But uh, it's his friend, and yeah. they don't get away with destroying it. And it makes a decision later on not to blow up the plane, not to be the gun. Right. You know, it can learn, and it starts to realize what that, uh, what that death entails. It learns about death and essentially makes a conscious decision not to to kill things and it even shows remorse when it thinks hogarth is dead it really i mean it shows remorse like a human being mm -hmm. would it's you know uh, physically hunched over and kind of weeping in sadness at his death and so that's the the great part about not knowing really its origins is that it can start to feel it can sure. start to have emotions and there's no suspension of disbelief to that yeah we just go well you don't know where it comes from it's so it's from a planet where there's emotional robots right you can't say that does it, who even knows it's a robot That's you know true. it's just a thing from another planet and so we can't say as an audience well it can't weep and it can't feel and it can't learn there's no suspension there but that kind of makes this a story about free will uh -huh. that becomes a story about you have choices that you can make there's no predetermination to say you have to be a killing machine. And then, you know, Hogarth, getting back to your idea of the perfect child. Sure. Hogarth is fighting for this robot like only a naive child would right. when it is a death ray. Right. At the point where it's got three extra arms or tentacles or whatever, yeah. and the sky is scorched red and it's shooting these devastating beam weapons yeah. just everywhere it goes. It's decimating the entire town. There's such a, a tonal change in mood yeah. for the movie there. It still fits well within the movie. You don't feel a shift oh, as if yeah. we're telling a different story. Right. But there is real fear now. Yeah. The fear is very realized. This is just the worst thing that could happen is now happening in this town. And this is what it looks like. And it's some of the coolest stuff in the movie, oh, I yeah. think. You know, we've been having this great conversation about uh, 50s universe and political motifs and... Uh, and this is from a Vin Diesel movie. Yeah. A lot of people might not know this, or maybe I was the only one the first time I saw it that didn't uh, see it until the very end. But uh, Vin Diesel has, this is somebody I find myself in the odd position of defending all the time because he gets attached to these projects and they're not necessarily the ones that people know him for. Right. I mean, people know him for some bad movies he did in... Triple uh, like X. The, the pacifier Triple that kind of X. stuff yeah pacifier he also did a lot of the fast and the furious movies right at least one of which is you know sub film levels of terrible i can confidently say that and no one will disagree with me but vin diesel and this is my favorite characteristic about the guy and why i see a lot of the stuff that he's in he has one of the greatest voices of any living human being alive uh -huh. he has this kind of deep terror robot voice yeah you know Honestly, I'm jealous of it. As someone who comes on here every week and records a show, I'm jealous of Vin Diesel's voice. Yeah. It's next to uh, Mike Patton, I think, or maybe Clancy Brown, another great uh, uh -huh. great voice. When he did uh, Escape from Butcher Bay, that was one of the, uh, in kind of the Riddick series, you know, he did Pitch Black, that movie too. Mm -hmm. He was a big fan of Pitch Black creatively, and he really fought for there to be more parts to that Riddick series. And he wrote kind of a lot of those ideas and then went over to do, I mean, Escape from Butcher Bay is just, it's better than all of that stuff. Assault on Dark Athena was good too. I think I mentioned Michelle Forbes doing really good voice work in that. But when you get to his bigger stuff like Fast and the Furious, it's a hard sell, but there are good moments in that stuff too. Yeah. That last Fast and the Furious movie is, man, just great fucking heist film. And uh, Vin Diesel's just one of those oddities where I rarely have an opportunity to stand up and go hey, look at this cool artistic thing he made. And if it's the robot voice in the Iron Giant, so fucking be it. All right, so then there's My Neighbor Totoro. This is uh, the first Studio Ghibli film that you and I have talked about on the show before. There's a lot of Miyazaki, and we've been kind of working our way up to 
exploring the other continents on planet fucking Earth. Yeah. And so, you know, My Neighbor Totoro was a movie that came out. The studio is pretty famous. We've talked about the distributor, about Toho before, yeah. about doing a, a lot of the Godzilla stuff. Sure. The early the, kaiju. Yeah, for sure. And the later kaiju. And the Studio Ghibli stuff and a lot of the Miyazaki stuff who does things under that studio. It's a movie, uh, My Neighbor Totoro, that was originally double featured when it came out with Grave of Fireflies, uh -huh. which is another, I mean, upon the release, My Neighbor Totoro was the B film. It was the underdog between those two, which yeah. is funny to think about now because it's a really popular movie. Sure. Well, it's uh, culty, is yeah, why. It Grave is, of Fireflies, I remember hearing a lot about. It's not a Miyazaki film, right. but it's a Studio Ghibli film, and it's a really, really popular one. I feel like Totoro is a lot more our kind of film. It was fucking released by Troma in the yeah. 90s. Or they were, Troma did a dub of it, and it wasn't even really Troma. It was uh, 50th Street Films, I think is yeah. the name of their indie distributor right. or whatever. And they did the dub in the 90s long before Disney worked out a deal to do the newer dub where they had, you know, all of these newer actors, I guess, sure. come in and, and do this stuff. IMDb still refers to the other version as the trauma version, and I think that's funnier. Yeah. So I'm going to go with that. Yeah, well, the dubbing in, in uh, I mean, in anything, there's always this thing that, I mean, and I feel like we may have talked about it on the show before, mm -hmm. maybe say with Let the Right One In. Sure. There's always been this disconnect with me about, the integrity of dubbing sure not necessarily because you know you're recording over what the film has already recorded but because foreign languages typically don't translate directly sure to another language well and a lot of times it is that you're re-recording stuff and you the new stuff just sounds terrible right well yeah and and you get the inflection wrong or right. you know you take the thing that people tend not to realize with the dubbing is that voice acting is still acting. Yeah. And that you may misconstrue what the character means sure. with the intonation of the line. The fear of dubbing for me has always been the purity of the original product. Right. Um, Having said that, the Miyazaki films are right. known for their dubs. There's, there's always, they always get really big name actor i mean this is what dakota and ella fanning sure this is one of the lesser star studded yeah, ones exactly. too i mean by the time uh miyazaki you know ponyo came out over here um who was in the it was uh you know kate blanchett and matt damon um tina fey liam neeson was in that i mean it's just it's an absurd betty white i think was in it yeah the cast is fucking ridiculous so we we pull back to something like this an earlier miyazaki movie and it's, you know, it's the Fannings and it's other sure. uh, American actors, but everybody, I mean, that's one of the things I like the most about My Neighbor Totoro. I was trying to think why this is, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the Miyazaki library. He's done a lot of movies and they, uh, they tend to be really cult films, every sure. single one of them, almost to the point where you would just consider it a mainstream success. No, absolutely. Well, didn't a few of them have got even gotten Academy Award nominations? Sure. As sure. still, I would say, you know, Spirited Away, I know, got a ton of acclaim. Yeah. And I would still write that up as a cult film first. Yeah. Just a very popular one. So each individual film has these fan bases, but, you know, the fans aren't unaware of the other Ghibli stuff. Sure. I mean, I like a lot of the Miyazaki stuff. But I'm trying to think, all right, what is it about Totoro that makes it my favorite and pretty pretty much far away my yeah. favorite one of these films and that's a bizarre thing to me because totoro for me has always seemed like a very like a smaller i mean because i saw it when i was very young mm -hmm. i was watching totoro and little nemo sure at, uh, yeah. at the same time in yeah my life. definitely i could see that um well totoro came out originally in 88 i think right. that the one dub was in 93 or something sure yeah it's i mean it's not even the underdog thing for me it's the uh, it's the best use of the elements I really like out of the Miyazaki films. Mm -hmm. The creatures and the images I feel like are some of the strongest, not the weirdest by any stretch, right? But some of the most memorable ones. The the world and the tone, the kind of story it's telling, but also that performance from the kids. I mean, the you know the kids' performance is the most intense of any of uh, of the movies. Um, May and Sutsuki, um the two Fanning sisters. I think it's Ella and uh, Dakota, right? Yeah. And, you know, I've seen Ella in Super 8 with him. Yeah. But, I mean, I'm not, like, a huge Fanning fan or anything. Yeah, that's not, not even crazy really... about the Fanning sisters. Well, it's not, it's not, like, the reason I come to this sure. movie. But you watch it, and the way they play off each other and the fucking... 
just the the vibrance of the performance especially the character may yeah and i think a lot of that and this goes back to what i was saying about animation and this is i mean it's the it's the flip side of that is if you're good at animating i mean the emotion of just the drawings sure comes off so strongly as long sure. as you have some capable voice acting behind it sure i mean there is no doubt just in the way the characters are animated and the way they move with each other mm -hmm. that they're very very emotionally connected oh yeah and plus it can't hurt that the two voice actors are actually sisters sure yeah you see that and you hear it the mm -hmm. characters are extremely excited and i feed off that excitement sure i mean that's one of the biggest things it's why totoro makes me happy I see my neighbor Totoro and it can just, it can get me out of any kind of fucking awful mood. It's almost humorous to me. The, you know, rats, you squirrels are better. You yeah. Know, just the, the fucking things they say are ridiculous. And the way that uh, May kind of echoes her sister just in that excitement just kind of says a lot of the same things she says. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned, all right, they're sisters and obviously that's helping or whatever, but they can't ad-lib because right. they only have so much space right. with the animation. So even if they are ad-libbing a little bit, it's got to be really constrained. And so I feel like it's not even just the usual cheat of, oh, we got two people in the room, there's chemistry, we cut around it, whatever. They have to do, they can't even edit the animation. Right. They have to do a faithful, you know, adaptation of a movie that's, for one, already been fucking dubbed in the United States once before. And uh, I, I don't even really have any tangible or objective reason it's funny to me. It just gets me. <laughs> Those characters, I mean, this is also kind of a tie to the Iron Giant, I guess. They're being mostly raised by their father alone while their mother is sick. And that's something about the characters in this particular movie. I mean... All the Miyazaki characters have weird things about them. Sure. They're not a normal cast of animated characters ever. And when they are, it's to point out how abnormal that is. But for their mother to be sick, it seems weird, this kind of story of sickness. It's not common in animation. It's, uh, it's something we like to just forget about, not unlike death from the mm -hmm. Iron Giant. We just don't want to... We want to go to an animated film and have a good time. And somehow we do that in Totoro. But the only driving part of really anything in this movie, plot or otherwise, is that their mother's sick. Yeah, it's certainly not common. It's the kind of connection to the real world you get out of something like Grave of Fireflies. Right. Where it seems like we're, we're going to get pulled down into reality just a little bit here. And it brings enough gravity to it that we only have to talk about it once or twice. And it can actually stand as the whole kind of narrative of the movie mm -hmm. and that lets us just drift off into free world you know the rest of the time it's a world that uh i mean i like their father i like that he kind of humors them he uh it's not necessarily that he doesn't see the totoros but he doesn't even question it he never tries to break the fantasy of right. that world so much so that the fantasy could be part of the world it could actually be there or it might be all in the, the girls' heads. Well, yeah, I mean, the entire... I mean, this goes back to kind of what I was saying about Iron Giant, but mm -hmm. the girls allow this fantasy into their world. I mean, yeah. not to say that it's not there, because I'm not saying that it's all in their heads. I don't sure. want to come off that way. But they're constantly in search of this wonder and this fantasy. I mean, quite literally, they follow the white rabbit into sure. a rabbit hole. Sure, Yeah, there's um, a lot of Alice in Wonderland yeah. going on here. And uh, it's just, they live in... A definite reality, mm -hmm. but there's just this general air of fantasy and wonder that feels like it's only they're the only ones who see it, not because sure. it's not there, but because they're so welcoming and open sure. to that sort of thing. I mean, nobody else sees the cat bus. No, but it does operate on the same schedule as the other buses. Uh -huh. It's like when you try and get on the 36, but you end up on the 22 instead. Yeah. Cat bus. The world itself is amazing as a retreat because it just allows you to plan it. You right. don't ever have to have an objective there. You can kind of just hang out in that world. It's a world that is so free of any ending, it doesn't even really have antagonists to it. Right. It's not only that, oh, this ride has to be over at some point. You don't get that, but you also don't have, you know, when you think about Alice in Wonderland, right. the idea is, oh, you got to get out of Wonderland. And that happens with a lot of, uh, when we think about Mirror Mask or sure. something like The Fall. Yeah, there we go. The Guillermo del Toro stuff. Yeah. Any of these movies, 
it's always uh snap back to reality yeah it's always you have to choose between your whimsical fantasy world sure. and being a human sure. being that's sure. you're right that isn't the case here at all no there's no there's no rush it's always uh you got all the time in the sure. world just take a nap everything's fine and there's nothing scary. The scariest thing about this world is also the most adorable thing. Totoro. You know, yeah. I, <laughs> actually, I think the scariest thing about this world might be the goat at the end of the movie. Yeah. That was fucking that's terrifying. But there's no real threat. There's no problem. Uh, the scariest fucking thing, man, is taking naps in right. the middle of the forest. Well, you know, that kind of brings me to a subject that I wanted to broach regarding Miyazaki, which is the question that I always have about his films is because they generally dabble in this level of fantasy, some mm -hmm. far more than others. Sure. But do you ever step back and wonder if they're just not on Earth? Oh, if this is uh, like if another... It's just, I mean, you know, we talk about um, the world of Tarantino and the Tarantino universe, sure. where X and Y are all in the same universe, sure. and that's why this, and that's why they have the same last name. Sure. But... Do you ever wonder if the Miyazaki universe, the planet that we focus on in the Miyazaki universe, is fundamentally different than our planet? Or if the stories carry over from one another. Right. You know, if they weave together. Yeah, I mean, I guess you see some of the same kind of elements uh, show up in, like, the little dust things. Right. That's in Spirited Away, right. too. Well, and I like that idea because then you're divorcing the fantasy from the reality even less. You're consolidating the suspension sure. of disbelief. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's you, all just you just have to believe there's another planet where yeah, all this is happening. You just, as soon as you as soon as you accept that, everything else can be reality. Yeah, you know, talking about not snapping back. I mean, we have uh, something you might consider a conflict in their sick mother. Yeah, but unlike something we did like Mirror Mask. It's not looming or waiting for you at the end of your adventure. Right. You know, so we do have that kind of one harmonious sure. world where we can go and hang out in this spot and uh, the resolution of whatever's happening in place B isn't connected to place A in some right. way. Right. Well, yeah, that's the thing is it's not, they don't use riding Totoro and playing with all these creatures. They don't use that as escapism. Right. It's not. The little girls are so worked up yeah. over their sick mother that they needed to invent an imaginary universe where sure. they can... No, that's not what goes on. Yeah. They're worked up over their sick mother, and when they're not writing Totoro, they, you know, write <laughs> sure. her letters. Yeah. yeah, it is important to her, but it can't be all day, every yeah. day. Yeah, and I guess it, it kind of goes to show, too, that if it works in this world, it'll work in other fictional universe. I mean, an idea like you don't need an antagonist. Right. It's kind of a bizarre idea. Sure. I think that's one of the things that makes this movie what it is for me. It's a place I can go. There's no antagonist. It just makes me so fucking yeah. happy. Like nothing's going to fuck with you while you're there. Nothing's you don't have to get anything to done. Killing machine. Yeah. You don't have any agenda while you're there. You don't have a, oh, well, I do have to get to the end of this thing and collect sure. these six items by the yeah. time I get here in order right. to save this. Well, the worst thing you have to do is meet your dad for the bus and then he doesn't show up. Right. I might take a nap and no one's going to yell at me when I wake up. Uh -huh. That might happen in my neighbor Totoro. The fucking Totoro show up at the bus stop. You know what? Can we talk about the Totoros for a second? Oh, my God. That really is, and it's the, the cheapest thing, but no, fuck that. It's not. People know that the Totoros from My Neighbor Totoro are awesome. Yeah. I mean, I've said all this great stuff that I like about it, but the thing, if I'm going to be honest, I like is that I see the Totoros and I get excited. Yeah. I love them. They're goofy. They're amazing. The, uh, the first time you see one is, you know, they're hanging out, looking under the house. May's looking under the house mm -hmm. or whatever, looking through that hole, and... You see the blue one with the bag and the little fucking super small white one. And they, uh, they, you know, appear in this way that is so cartoonish. Yeah. Way more cartoonish than any of the Miyazaki movies mm -hmm. tend to. They're cartoonish in their own way, but this is like a fucking Looney Tune. It makes yeah. the Looney Tune sound when they bolt off. Yeah. With their tiny little legs with no limbs, uh -huh. no joints. And even the way they appear, it has that very American xylophone yeah. before they make the takeoff sound. The xylophone that is essential before you do the sure. tornado leg takeoff. They run off, and that's just that's the beginning of the adventure. So the Totoros are 
you know, also where everything begins. They lead you down that Alice in Wonderland path. Yeah. Who would have thought that if you took the sinister elements out of Alice in Wonderland, that ever be? Usually, I'm I'm the guy who's all make about it darker. Like, make it darker. American McGee's Alice yeah, in Wonderland. Right. You know what I mean? The Alice in Wonderland games, especially that fucking new one. Just the the new game, not on the, the new film. Yeah, the new game. Yeah, just focus on the dark elements and the. You know, you come back to the reality world, it's even more brutal than the Alice in Wonderland world. Yeah. Just everything's in a competition to be darker. We do the opposite with Totoro, and we say, Alice in Wonderland world, but no rush, no emergency, nothing's going to try and chop right. off your head. And especially when you're first going down that tunnel between the trees, you get this sense that you're wandering into their world. It's this kind of ramp up to, all right, it's time to meet a lot of creatures. It's time to get a lot of the fantasy elements. It reminds me every time I see this that the real My Neighbor Totoro hasn't even kicked in yet. We're yeah. not even, we haven't even really begun the journey. If there's anything that could be called a plot, that's what it is. Uh -huh. It's just about exploring, and it doesn't need an excuse for that. It's just kind of, hey, remember when you were a kid and you could just hang out for a couple hours and wander around and that was enough to satisfy you? Yeah. Totoro can get away with doing that. Just seeing where that adventure kind of leads to is driving the plot. It's the questions of, because movies need plots, that's why they have them. Mm -hmm. And what's substituting our plot here is kind of going, well, what the fuck's going to happen next? Where could this, it's the same thing that works with surrealism. Right. Just thinking to yourself, where, how deep does the fucking proverbial rabbit hole sure. go? How fucking batshit insane is this going to be? And then you get to the King Totoro, yeah. which is... I mean, the King Totoro has been an amazing success outside of this film. Sure. It's everywhere. It's, um, you know, it's the fucking logo for Studio Ghibli. What is it about this giant Totoro thing that makes it, I mean, you can objectively say it's awesome. Yeah. The free market has demonstrated that Totoro is awesome. King Totoro is awesome. Capitalism agrees. When I was fucking in uh, Cupertino, they had a shop of Totoros. Wow. It was just that all it sold was Totoros. You Every time everything. I go back there, I try and make a, a side trip over to the Totoro shop to buy. So it's ridiculous. Why? I, first off, it's the size. He's just okay. a massive creature. And sure. then he's round. And okay. he has a goofy smile and his deep... His, I mean, for me, the King Totoro wins my heart over when he likes the sound of rain on an umbrella. Right. Um, sure. But just that the the low smiling noise that he makes. Oh God, and the just voice that he's too. lazy and simple and friendly. Yeah, for the bag of mail, I'm sure we're gonna come back to uh, as soon as this show is posted and everyone makes fun of the way I pronounce Totoro. I want to say it's a mispronunciation of. The Japanese word troll. Mm -hmm. One of the versions of the movie has like a jab about that. Yeah, they kind of made there. they kind of make a reference to it in the version, the American version. Yeah, that's yeah. the new one, right? Yeah. So it's the name of all these creatures. The king one is just the big one with the scary voice. It's the one that I mean, I like the small ones just as much, maybe even if not more than the giant one. But uh, it's it's a little scary to me. Yeah. You know, it's cute and it's sleeping and it has a voice that's huge and deep, like a fucking monster. You're worried it's going to eat you. It's a giant whale or something. There's almost a little bit of danger that lingers around it just because of the way it sounds and the scary fucking... Is the Totoro a little scary? Am I crazy? Oh, no. I think you're... Yeah, it's terrifying. It's got a tiny, it's tiny big. little mouth. Yeah. And then it it yawns or sneezes or whatever the fuck it's going to do. Right. It looks like it might accidentally eat you. You just don't know anything about it. And that's what makes it scary is sure. that it's so big that at any time it could be like, well, I've just been pumping you up. Yeah. You bite your brains out. Close your eyes in the scene where May meets the Totoro and just listen to the sounds it makes. It's fucking terrifying. It would be a failure if I didn't mention the cat bus too. When cat we're talking bus. about creatures. I mean, I love the Totoros, but what the fuck cat bus? I love the cat bus. It's got headlights for eyes and uh, centipede feet. Yeah, the cat bus is tail. It's the most nonsensical creature <laughs> to ever. Okay, so what? Yeah, it's it's when a, a cat and a centipede fuck a bus. Is that, yeah, I mean, with a raccoon what, tail. You always think about the kind of things that they do in a lot of sci-fi movies where what if this this animal was blended with this piece of technology? Sure. How wonderful. Sure. What benefit does a cat have to also be a bus? Yeah, right. And furthermore, like have to follow a schedule. Like, sure. The thing that I <laughs> right, always right. the thing that I always get is um when it changes its little destination thing to say hospital. Sure. And they get really excited that it's going to take them to the hospital sure. as if it has somewhere else to be. <laughs> right. 
cats. It's a it's a cat that's a <laughs> right. bus. Right. If if it's doing anything and it's not sleeping, its job because for some reason it's a bus, an actual active bus. It's not an off duty bus. Yep. Yep. Is to take people to the places they need to go. God. And it makes when the door opens, it makes these '80s sci-fi sounds. Right. As the door's moving around. Just nothing about the cat. Where bus does it make... take Totoro? You know, if there's anything that makes sense about the cat bus, it's that it flies. Yeah. You might say, well, that just adds another weird... Fo-. That's the Miyazaki thing I get before any other Miyazaki stuff, is that you just have a fucking airship all the time. It's just... This is Final Fantasy, apparently. Yep. There has to be an airship in every goddamn movie or something that flies. Yeah. It's usually some kind of vehicle yep. that flies around. But the Totoros fly, too. Yep. They use their newfound... Um, once they get those fucking umbrellas, man, they sure. do not let off the umbrellas. Well, they it love starts with the little top, but then he yeah. just decides, I don't need the top this time. Well, there's the scene of them holding the umbrellas outside right. waiting for the cat bus. It's this weird Blade Runner kind of looking scene. Yeah. You know, you, you want to talk about how we're always bringing up Blade Runner on this show. Just the rain just coming down in sheets and standing there... I think most notable frame of any Miyazaki, maybe any animated thing ever, it just burns in my mind sure. the surrealness of them at a bus stop, the most mundane yep. place in the fucking universe, With a Totoro. waiting on a bus, it's raining, Totoro, which I thought would be, you know, it pulls out and it shows the Totoro and it's fucking hilarious just because of how out of place it is. And then it pulls back again and it's showing the same scene. It turns out plus one umbrella makes it even fucking yeah. weirder. I thought, this is the weirdest thing I could ever see. Oh, no, wait. It could be holding a goddamn umbrella. Yeah. And then you're right. What the fuck is the Totoro doing at the bus stop? Yeah. Where is it going to go? Why is it there? The enigma of that is what I was talking about. It's enough to drive the scene. Because once you calm down from what the fuck is this Totoro doing here, then you think, well, wait, what the fuck is this Totoro yeah. doing here? Where does it have to go? And there's no answer. And then they get on a cat bus. Yeah, there's I also mean, the cat come bus. On, We've talked go... about the cat bus. Okay, but that's my point is that scene <laughs> yeah. is... Where the fuck is this going? It's got an umbrella. Wow. Yeah, this has gotten as weird as possible. And then the cat bus shows. That's the moment. And when then the, the dad shows up. Shows he up. says, sorry, I'm late. God. You're thinking something horrible happened. Okay, sorry. I didn't mean to go back to that. But it just, it gets absurder. That's when they drop the sure. cat bus. It's insane. Um, it's, you know, it's iconic too. You see the Totoro pop up all over the oh, place. Yeah. Uh, you had mentioned previously the Pixar stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a reference to it in forget which maybe the third toy story uh-huh. where there's just a big unassuming I totoro so, yeah. looming in the background it trolls your pictures yeah that's what the totoro does is it photo bombs you my favorite place for the totoro is in south park uh and and it's not actually the totoro that's my favorite it's in uh i don't remember if it was in uh mysterion rises or coon versus coon and friends sure one of the minberry crunch episodes sure well, it's uh, also in the imagination, the actual right. Totoro's sure. in that, but you're not talking about Totoro. No, I'm talking about when Cartman meets Cthulhu. Oh, God. And they they do, okay, so go. everybody should go online. Uh, we'll post a link, maybe. Yes, definitely. Um, there's a video on the YouTube, and it, somebody did a side-by-side comparison of the scene oh. where May falls onto Totoro. I didn't know there was a comparison. And That's great. Cartman climbs up onto Cthulhu and they do the exact same thing yeah. like to the same like with the same shots like sure. they have a shot Salt out Park of Cthulhu's mouth they're, yeah they're great with that um and then Cartman gets up on Cthulhu and they do the yeah. mockery of the Totoro song yeah it's hilarious and I fucking love it it's a uh, Tanari no Totoro it's the not the opening thing but the right. thing at the end I think right. it's just translated my neighbor Totoro I uh-huh. think that's the name of the song the um What's great about that episode of South Park is they have these things they call two percenter jokes, Mm -hmm. which I believe we've talked about on the show. It's just this obscure, you know, sometimes it's a reference, um, but more often when it's done really well, it's a joke that's just predicated upon knowing about some really obscure thing before you get the joke itself. This is like a one percenter because you don't just have to know my neighbor Totoro. But you also have to know what Cthulhu is. Right. Like, if you're not familiar with Cthulhu, that's a bizarre enough idea. Like, can you imagine the people who saw that episode and didn't know what either of those things were? Right. They would be, I saw that episode, knew what both of those things were very well, and was yeah. still going out of my fucking mind. Yeah. I can't even imagine coming to that without any of that information. It just seems like the weirdest goddamn yeah. thing ever. I wanted to talk about Tanari no Totoro, which I'm just going to keep pronouncing as if I'm confident that's how it's uh-huh. done. There is um, 
Well, first of all, there's a thing called May and the Kitten Bus, which is a 13-minute follow-up to okay. My Neighbor Totoro. So check that out. But other thing to look up, mm-hmm. there was this compilation that was made, and it's just the... It continues down the path of weirdest goddamn thing ever. It is a metal compilation of Studio Ghibli theme covers. Yeah. So they take songs from, you know, from Ponyo and from uh, Kiki's Delivery Service and Spirited Away, all these different songs uh-huh. from the different movies, and they're, um, they're just extreme metal. Rend- it's the, the kind of metal that is, it's almost just people listen to it ironically. Yeah. It's like kitsch value metal. I mean, I listen to fucking Fear Factory, so what right. do I know about different kinds of metal, right? But uh, totally other side of that genre, just where the vocals are nearly indecipherable and it's just double bass and fucking blown out guitar the entire time. And then Japanese pop vocals as yeah. well. So in addition to the, the typical metal vocals, the Japanese pop stuff too. The compilations by uh, this collective called, at least for the project, called Imaginary Flying Monsters. <laughs> and I think the album is called Princess Ghibli. Yeah. It's really worth, I'll link to the, the video introduction thing awesome. of it but just hearing the chorus of the totoro because no one ever every time i play that for somebody never recognize it until it hits the chorus yeah and that is just this weird fucking shock moment all right enough about camp metal and uh giant <laughs> monsters there can never be enough and, about camp metal or giant monsters oh geez we have um we have a lot of movies next time on the show you want to talk about some fucking camp we're doing another Killapalooza next time. Oh my God. Is it that time already? Doublefeatureshow.com, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. You can tell that's the part I never care about talking about at the end. But we're going to force ourselves to endure a bunch of movies. This is almost getting to, to sleepaway camp uh, <laughs> territory. But I know there's a little bit of Eli Roth that happens in yeah. here some way. He makes an appearance. Yeah, we got some Eli Roth. We got some uh, some Roger Corman. Yeah, a little we got Doc some Joe Brown Dante. in here. We got some uh, some James Cameron going on. Yeah, that'll be interesting to revisit that in a Killapalooza, nonetheless. Yeah, got the uh, some Gulliger brothers. I yeah. Mean, so what's the what's the, the thing we're doing? Piranha. All of the Piranha movies. All of them. Oh crap! Watch more fucking film. Bye. <laughs>